Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Heroes, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, two things. One, I have been asked, and I don't necessarily know specifically why, but I have been asked to uh, issue a reminder to folks that uh, the source code to Handmade Hero, which comes with a pre-order, is not in the public domain yet. Uh, it is commercial source code and you're not allowed to redistribute it. Uh, as you can see down here, there is actually a thing that says this specifically. It's how will the source code be licensed. Uh, and it says that it will become public domain after two years. Uh, so basically, two years after the game is released, it'll be public domain. Uh, I should say in at least two years, meaning I could choose to release it sooner, um, but I can't choose to release it any later than that. Uh, so there you go, public service announcement. Uh, for whatever reason it was requested. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I'm awfully sick feeling today. So if I decide to, you know, just vomit all over the screen in the middle of this uh, stream, that is just how that's going to go. Uh, that is not me reacting to uh, the wonders of Visual Studio. Uh, I've used to it and it no longer nauseates me in the way that it probably should. Uh, this is actually just legitimate nausea coming from, you know, a virus or something like that. I have not been sick in like a year, um, so I certainly can't complain. Uh, it was not like when I first started Handmade Hero and I got sick like three times in a row. Uh, so anyway, um, I want to go ahead and just dive into what we were doing yesterday and just get it finished up. I, it was basically doing some an architecture shift. Uh, for how we have the renderer isolated. It's not a particularly difficult one. I explained it yesterday, uh, but we just have to kind of finish up uh, that architectural uh, shift. And so it's just, you know, it's just fussing. It's just a bunch of fussing. It's the kind of fussing you need to do when you decide to pull some code out from, you know, a place that it used to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started on that. Uh, and if you are trying to follow along at home, Today is day 241, so you want to start with day 240's uh, source code. And if you remember correctly, we didn't want anyone to be confused because normally almost every day, which is kind of weird because a lot of times this isn't true in commercial source bases, code bases, uh, but after we've never really ended an hour without stuff that still worked. Uh, but we yesterday, since we were in the middle of a refactor, we actually put um, uh, we actually put a notice in here that prevents you from building so that you can know that we're doing that. Uh, and uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and remove that and uh, we'll be back to what we were working on before, right? Okay, so really all we have to do here, uh, besides the inevitable debugging of make, making sure all our changes actually work, uh, which I'm sure we'll have some of that to do later on, uh, really the only thing we had left to do in terms of actually just getting everything compiling properly with the changed state uh, of how we wanted things to work is uh, the Win32 platform code, which now calls the renderer directly, uh, that code needs to be fixed because we, we have not finished it yet. Uh, so you can kind of see in here, it, it was still working off of stuff like the sort entry stuff, taking a memory arena. We want to just be able to pass temp memory in uh, directly to it now. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just go ahead and, and finish that cleanup, uh, and then we can move on to the debugging uh, phase of things, which is where we'll finish today. All right, so when we call our sort entries call, right, uh, when we have to actually display stuff, we go ahead and we do the sort here. We need to pass some temporary memory so that the sorting can occur. Uh, so we need like temp memory or, or sort memory, right, because we, we don't currently sort in place. And our sort of temporary assessment, although we didn't really do any, you know, particularly fancy work here or anything, uh, but one of the things that we did was we said, well, it looks like pretty much no matter what we end up doing for sorting, it'll probably, whether it's radix or merge or whatever else, uh, it looks like it'll probably be faster with temp space. Like doing it in place generally is just slower. And so since we can easily afford the extra space, it's not, we're not talking about gigabytes, we're talking about megabytes or less. Um, since we can probably afford the space on just about anywhere we're going to be running this game, uh, we should probably use temp space. So I'd like to always provide temp space to the sort thing. And if we want to do something that sorts in place, sometimes as, a, as an exercise, that's fine. But I think our final sort will almost certainly want some temporary memory for speed purposes. Uh, so I'm going to say that there's like temp or sort memory that comes in here. 
uh, when we call win3 display buffer in window, and that way when we call sort entries, it just gets uh, some sort memory uh, that it can use. And so it won't do any of these things here. Uh, and uh, it'll also uh, take a look here at, uh, I guess there's nothing really. The temp space is just looks like this. Uh, put that in there for now. Uh, so when it comes in here, we've got the sort memory. Um, I'm not sure, just temp space was the call for there. Uh, so we'll just replace that with sort memory for now. There we go. I don't know why this stuff is still here. And uh, now we'll recompile and see where we're at. All right. Uh, so on sort entries, the push buffer element count, apparently not a mem member of render group. Hey, that's uh, not an accident. In fact, these are not really supposed to be taking render group anymore. All of this stuff that was taking render group previously should now be taking one of those uh, command sets, right? Because all of this stuff, again, we kind of pulled it all out. So we really don't want to see render group out here anymore. Render group is a thing that the game uses to batch up stuff that it wants to render. Uh, so we're really talking about game render commands. Uh, and so render group, anything that was happening in here uh, in render group, uh, we would like it to, to uh, instead happen. Um, oops. Although that probably actually is a, uh, what we would want to call this function instead of render group to output. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, so maybe this is, you know what, maybe let's just change it while we're in here. Um, let's, let me see. Um, let me see. I feel like I'm a little too high up. Um, just not, not adjusted well. I need to be better adjusted. All right, there we go. There we go, much better. Uh, all right, so yeah, <clears throat> like I was saying, uh, we've got uh, we've got sort of this uh, thing that will switch between which way we want to render, and now it's really probably not correct to call it render group to output or any of these things, right? Tiled render group to output. We probably just want to call it, you know, uh, tiled uh, commands render or something like this, uh, and that will take game uh, render commands, like so. Uh, and yeah, that, that feels to me like a, a better idea. So here's our tiles command render. There we go. That's going to take uh, the commands. It, and uh, oh, yeah, and the render queue. Whoops. So I didn't mean to delete that guy. That's fine. You could take that queue. Uh, it's this guy uh, that's going to be different. And so that's all good. And then when this guy calls through, again, he's not uh, just just in the exact same way. He's not going to do any of, um, you know, and we don't need this guy anymore either, actually. Uh, so he's not going to do any of the stuff with render group anymore. Either he's going to uh, exclusively do stuff uh, with those commands. So the work thing is going to take the commands. Uh, and it looks like he doesn't really touch anything else, so that's fine. Uh, so here is commands and tile render work, uh, where we—I don't actually know—that's probably still defined over in render group. Uh, let's see, tiled render work. Yeah. So this tile render work stuff too—that's going to come out here, presumably. Uh, we could make a separate H file if we wanted. I'm not sure if we want to or not. Uh, but this is going to be in game. This is this is going to be game render commands. And there's that loaded bitmap output target in the clip rect. Uh, so this is the stuff that the that the um, that the actual renderer uses now. Okay, so let's see. Uh, this is our sort memory. This it wants to have it cast to that, so that's fine. Uh, inside here we've got our push buffer elements and that stuff. Okay, so all of our render group stuff again is just going through commands. So that's just a, a case of telling it to use uh, something different here. And this will, of course, be uh, render commands to bitmap. That's probably the right uh, phrase for this. There we go. And uh, yeah, I feel like that's really what we need for the most part. 
Uh, so platform add entry. So this is nice because now we can also just, we could really, we don't really have to access platform anymore. Um, we can just use the add entry call probably directly, uh, right? We wouldn't need it to be exported to us because we know we're being compiled as part of the system. That said, you know, we can continue to go through that platform, uh, that concept if we wanted to, uh, and I'm not sure which way we want to do it. It's relatively straightforward to make it work both ways, uh, to, to make it irrelevant like which one you happen to go through. Because if you remember, the way that we did that is we had the platform thing was a global variable with the platform API in it. Uh, and so we've got that same thing. <clears throat> uh, we should have that same thing uh, available if we want to outside of it, right? Because that's in, that's in uh, handmadeplatform.h. Right, that, that platform API, uh, we create one of those, or we must. I mean, how do we not create one of those? Oh, you know what? It's probably, it's welded into uh, this guy. So it's in game memory there, right? So if we wanted to, we could easily take the platform API there and have that be available outside in here as well. So that, you know, like the render and stuff could get at it. Meaning if we wanted to, we could make the platform API uh, be something that's available out here. So maybe we'll just do that because that way we don't have any kind of weirdness uh, with, uh, with, you know, when we move code back and forth between the two, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? It's basically like just makes it so that it doesn't matter where code exists, they can still call through it if they want to. That way we can cut and paste code in, to the platform layer and out of the platform layer, and we don't have to like port it every time or change the way that it works, you know? Uh, and that seems like a good idea to me. Uh, okay, so let's see, temp arena is, what's going on with temp arena? That we don't really want to use at all. We want that to just be our sort memory here, right? So our sort memory comes in and we just use it. Render to OpenGL, identifier not found. Uh, well, we should have OpenGL rendering support here somewhere. Um, so it's this. Uh, let's see. Render commands, OpenGL render commands, something like that. So this would probably be like uh, software render commands. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that seems better. All right, so there's OpenGL, there's, yeah, there's that, and then I can just sort of come in here and say, okay, tile commands render is actually called that. And then they're uniformly named. Seems reasonable. All right, so then we've got an output target. Uh, the output target is gonna be our global bitmap, I believe, right, uh, is probably the thing that we want to target there, and, that, uh, and then we would want to, yeah, and then we would want that to be, uh, workable as well. So let me, let me take a look here at uh, where we're at, OpenGL, display bitmap. So display bitmap via OpenGL is not an actual thing. We're talking actually about this is what we want. Uh, and here is all of these guys, width, height, memory, pitch, window width, window height, right? Uh, and software render commands, that guy takes uh, that guy takes a loaded bitmap as the output target. I don't think we have one of those. Exactly. Uh, what we have instead is a Win32 off-screen buffer, which is the global back buffer, right? Uh, and so that guy, the global back buffer, we can just use directly to, uh, you know, we can, we can just basically make a loaded bitmap that points into that, because uh, it has all the same stuff, right? It's got, it's got the exact same uh, stuff in it. So the global back buffer and the output target, we can sort of do both of them. Output target memory equals global back buffer dot memory. Uh, and then we can just do like width, height, pitch. And I think, 
that should be roughly what we want there. Uh, similarly, we can kind of just do this now. Uh, and that will do our bitmap display for us as well. So that's now plumbing, plumbing wise correct. Uh, this stuff, I guess, is really buffer is just output target. I, I could, I suppose, just say buffer arrow output target dot. And I think that's roughly correct. Uh, oh. So that's got to be from the global back buffer because we don't keep that anywhere else. Let's see here. Height, width, memory. And these, I guess, maybe I should have those be the global back buffer as well instead. Like maybe that's a little bit more correct since it has to be that, since we have to have the info, info for it. Uh, we could replace, uh, let's see here. I want to do output target dot with global back buffer dot. Okay. Uh, global back, oh, you know what? It's probably back buffer with a lowercase b because I'm the worst at being consistent with my camel caps. Try that one more time. There we go. All right, so we don't have this anymore. It's gone because now we don't pass that through. Uh, and so I don't even know if that was still in here. It is, so that's gotta go away, goodbye. Um, because we don't call that anymore. And now Win32 display buffer and window. Uh, that's got everything it needs except the temp memory now, right? Because the Win32 display buffer and window uh, has to take that temp memory, right? And it has to take a couple things too. It has to take the render queue exactly, the high priority queue. Uh, so it's got to take the render queue, it's got to take the render commands, it needs the device context, window width and height, and then it needs the temp memory. Uh, so we got to pass the temp memory here. And the temp memory really wants to be a thing that's however big it needs to be for the render commands, right? And so really, I guess what we want here is something like, uh, this, is, this is our sort memory. We want something like, okay, if, you know, the sort memory, uh, you know, uh, needed sort memory size and current sort memory size, uh, we could say if the amount of sort memory we, we currently have uh, is less than the amount we need, then we'll get the amount we need instead, right? So we'll virtual uh, free and virtual alloc new sort memory. So that way we'll make sure we always keep some, we always grab as much memory uh, as we need. So, you know, we, we could just say we just fail uh, or don't sort if we go over is the other option. Uh, I'm not sure which one of those makes more sense. Uh, dynamically growing. It depends what you want to do. Dynamically growing means that probably you're always going to be safe on most machines, but it does mean that, you know, in theory, you could overflow your memory. For some reason, you drew so many things and needed to sort them that you allocated more memory than you were expecting or something. Um, I'm not sure that's really possible. And we could always, we always know what the upper bound is because it has to fit inside there, but I'm gonna do it as allow it to dynamically grow because like I said, I wanted to show you guys later how to make the arenas grow dynamically as well. And so I feel like we probably wanna just make sure that everything can be flexible if you want to, and then turn it off if we want to lock it to a certain size. Um, Cause it's, we could always just stop doing the if, right? And don't, render when we can't sort or something. Anyway, uh, so we'll free the sort memory and then we'll allocate the sort memory again, if that makes sense. Uh, and so that's really all I wanted to be able to do. So basically like we would say, okay, the current sort memory, uh, sorry, the needed sort memory size is going to be however many render commands there were, right? So it's render commands, uh, push buffer element count 
times the size of uh, the tile uh, sort entry. And so that is how much memory we would need to sort. And so if we don't have that much, we can just allocate some more, right? Uh, and that way, once we hit our high watermark, uh, we'll never allocate. And in fact, we can just allocate off the bat something very high and make sure we're, we're in there, uh, right? Uh, so yeah, we have our win32 allocate and win32 deallocate. Uh, I guess I'll just call those, right? Win32 allocate memory. Win32 deallocate memory. Uh, yeah, that seems fine to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so then we just have our uh, current sort memory size. And let's just say that we start with like one megabyte of sort memory or something like this. Again, that can always be tuned uh, to something later if we want, which is, so that's more than presumably we would ever need. So this case would never get hit. Uh, and then we'd just say uh, our uh, void star sort memory uh, equals win32 allocate memory, uh, current memory sort size, and I think that's it. Um, seems reasonable. So, uh, yeah, that's all we need to do. Of course, obviously, we need to do this uh, before we, you know, start the game running. Certainly, so we, you know, we want that to be something that happens up here. Uh, and I don't know what else we would do. UMMs are not defined in the platform layer. Oh, weird. Well, they are now. That's a memory sized unsigned integer. I've been using it recently. I guess it's something I started doing. Don't know. Anyway, uh, so let's see. Uh, I think we're almost there. Uh, I think we've got most of the things we want to do here pretty wrapped up. So yeah, okay, that's all good. Um, let's see, needed sort memory size, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Feels reasonable. I feel like we could make an argument that, that was okay. Uh, so let's see, what do we got for unresolved symbols, draw rectangle, quickly, uh, where is that? That's in here. So we can finally get rid of all this stuff too, I think now. Uh, we should be able to just go ahead and uh, grab this out uh, from hand, made, hand optimized uh, and put that in here uh, after draw rectangle slowly, right? Um, we could just put that in here. Uh, and we can you know, choose to optimize this or not, uh, but I think we're all good. So here we go, we've got uh, uh, the ignored function stuff. I think this stuff doesn't need to be there. Let's go ahead and compile this. Uh, pixel fill, ignore timed block, uh, ignore timed block. There we go. Uh, so now we're compiling and in here, we can go ahead and, and get rid of, of the optimized thing in here, I believe. Um, this guy. Uh, I think we can just get rid of that uh, for the time being because now we have the hardware renderer. So if we want fast rendering in a debug build, we can always just use the hardware renderer. And we don't have to worry about having a special code uh, thing that forces something to always be optimized, which seems like good, right? Because now we can just build the whole thing and optimize if we want to see how fast the software or rasterizer runs. We don't have to always have that because we can't even do any development if we don't have it optimized, right? Uh, so that seems like a pretty good thing to me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say, let's just do that change. And we can always use the pound pragma trick uh, that people figured out how to finally do correctly on the forums. Remember, because we tried it on stream and it didn't work, but it turns out it's because you have to make sure you have inlines in the right place and stuff. But anyway, separate issue. 
Uh, so we can do that now, which is good because that gets rid of a little bit more complexity there. Uh, and it also means that we can delete that file entirely. Like we don't need a handmade, optimized, whatever nonsense that can go. So that's gone now. Goodbye. Uh, make sure it's killed from the buffer as well. All right, so now we're, we're like structurally sort of working, but we're probably not actually working because uh, we made like a ton of changes and we've got, you know, some debugging ahead of us certainly. Uh, but you know, we've got 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to make some headway uh, in, into that. So let's start by seeing where we like crash and burn first. All right, so I think the first thing is we probably don't initialize. Uh, yeah, we, so we aren't, we don't uh, initialize or reset or do anything for our, uh, for our actual render command. So we gotta take care of that first. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, so we've got this push buffer size, push buffer thing. Oh, wow. The, we never, this is awesome. It's actually, we never finished typing this in. So this virtual alloc is actually just, it's setting the void push buffer to point to the address of the virtual alloc function. That's amazing. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so we're gonna do a, a Win32 allocate memory here with the push buffer size. Uh, and this is something that we can move uh, also back up to the sort, like this, the same place we're doing the sort memory. Uh, so that seems like a reasonable thing to do, okay. Let's push a little further through there. Oh, all right. Uh, well, that was somewhat surprising. I wasn't expecting that to work uh, the first time, but I guess it did. Uh, yeah, so that's fine, I guess. Weird. Um, Well, I wasn't expecting that to work. I don't know. Uh, that that takes a little wind out of the sails. Gotta admit that, you know, wasn't expecting it to work. It worked. Uh, it worked. Even the debug code worked. So even the fact that we're now aggregating and it all it all just worked. Everything just worked, uh, which is crazy. And uh, I don't know what to say. I guess we just had good luck. Uh, maybe they were taking it easy on me. The gods of programming looked down and said he's sick today. Um, we won't give him a bunch of debugging to do. Thanks, guys. Uh, all right, so that's... I would, say, I would have something more trenchy to say about that if I wasn't feeling ill. Uh, all right, so I guess let's at least test the software side. Probably that, maybe that needs some debugging. Um, and uh, here's Win32 Display Buffer and Window, right? Uh, and so this is currently going through hardware and doing, uh, so, so the, this branch we're not testing at the moment. Uh, so maybe let's have a global variable that allows us to switch between hardware and software rendering or something, I don't know. Um, so here we go. Let's just have a global variable, uh, d32 use hardware rendering. Uh, and we can just say like, okay, global use hardware rendering is here. Uh, or maybe we'll do global use software rendering actually. Uh, that way the default value of false will be the one that we probably want to ship the game with. Boop. And oops. And so display via hardware equals true is still one that we use uh, here. Um, but this in hardware now goes away. Uh, okay, so now we've got a global variable uh, for that. And I have to actually declare it correctly, use software rendering. 
And so now, in theory, uh, I should be able to change between hardware and software rendering, software rendering uh, by editing the value of that variable. So for example, if I came in here, right, and set a, a breakpoint or something, well, I got to set a breakpoint somewhere where it's actually going to be hit, um, which is like here, let's say. Uh, then I should be able to do something like saying global use software rendering and uh, you can see that it's set to zero so it's using the hardware I can probably set it to one now and then something will happen and hey look it's software rendering right now it's incredibly slow software rendering because it's not being compiled optimized uh, but it is actually in software so what's kind of nice about that is uh, the other thing that, you know, is kind of cool if you now look at how we've got our architecture, it means you can just switch at runtime if you want to, right? Uh, so, you know, now we can just say like, oh, whatever you want to do with use, you know, software or hardware rendering. Uh, in fact, I don't even know, does our debug system, because we have to finish the debug system at some point, I don't know where we left that. Uh, can you edit true and false values in here? I felt like we had that at, at one point, but we like, you know, uh, we had sort of changed it around and did all this other stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if we can do something like this here where we have like a debug variable type path uh, sort of thing. And, you know, we had some stuff where like we would do uh, debug variable. We did some stuff like this. Right, and I feel like maybe we could do that with the with the hardware rendering. I don't know. We never. I, this is why we got to go back and finish this stuff because I really want these things to all actually be done. But most of them, you know, we kind of just stopped in the middle when we went on break, and we never came back to actually finish this code, which is unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in theory, like if that debug if if that that stuff actually worked. Um, then we could actually have that, you know, be a, be a thing. So that would be global use software rendering. We could do I don't know, does that work? Global constants render use software undeclared. Okay. Better. Uh, so I don't know what happens now because uh, I don't remember. Uh, so I don't know if we can. We can't actually click on this, can we? Because we don't actually have that stuff. Yeah, it looks like we almost had this stuff working. Like it displays up there. Hmm. Well, let's take a look. You know what, actually, now that I think about it, let's not take a look. I got a better idea. Because we want to go finish the debug system at some point. There's no point in opening up that as a can of worms. Uh, let's ignore that for now. I've got a better idea. Let's implement vSync. Because one of the reasons I wanted to do all the hardware stuff now anyway, besides the fact that we have uh, get a, a lot of free speed from it, uh, is that I wanted to have vSync. And so we could get vSync uh, pretty speed in a pretty straightforward fashion. And there's some things that I want to explain about how you do that anyway. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Uh, so why don't we have vSync at the moment, right? First of all, does everyone know what vSync is? Might be another good uh, thing. And I, I kind of take it for granted that you do. And the reason is because even if you're not uh, a graphics programmer, you, if you're, even if you, just, if you just play games, you probably know what vSync is, right? So vSync, is really uh, a sort of an old school concept. In the old days, right, on a CRT, on a cathode ray tube, um, I don't know if you guys remember these guy things, they were like uh, the old sort of TVs that are super long, right, the way TVs originally were, and there was like an electron beam thing that would like 
literally scan across the screen in like this zigzag pattern like this, lighting up the phosphorus that was on the, coated on the front glass plate, right? And those phosphorus, when the electron hit the phosphorus, it would emit a color. Uh, and that's how, you know, there'd be like little red, green, and blue dots. They would light up those with certain different intensities. And that's how you would get television, right? Uh, and so the reason that it's called V-Sync is because as this happened, at the end, it would get to the bottom and it would have to, the, the gun thing, this, this, this electron gun that's like lighting up the display, would have to kind of come all the way back and start again at the top. And during that period where it comes back to start at the top was like the synchronization period where you would start the next frame. It was called vertical sync or V-sync. And so what happens is that phrase became known as waiting for the right time, whatever that means in your current system, waiting for the right time to update the frame such that, you, such that the thing displaying it, whether it's an LCD or a CRT like the old days or whatever, doesn't like end up showing the user half the old frame and half the new frame, right? Because what happens if it's in the middle of updating and you change the frame right in the middle is you'll end up with some portion of the frame is the old one and some portion is the new one that the user actually sees. And that manifests itself as like a, a tear, right? It's called tearing. And so you end up with a thing that's like, oh, the handmade hero is moving across the screen and there's this little like line where his, his bottom part is like, is moving ahead of his top part or something, right? Happens. Uh, because this is from the next frame and this is from the previous frame and, and you end up with the, or this is from the current frame and this is from the previous frame, right? So VSync, it just means that, right? And we, we want it for our game to prevent tearing, certainly, but we also want it to try to get steady timing so that our timing is synced with the video properly. Um, and so what we can do is we can ask OpenGL for it uh, there's a thing called WGL swap interval, or it might just be GL swap interval. I don't remember. I don't remember whether it's a Windows call or a regular call. I think it might be a regular call. Uh, so it might just be GL swap interval. Uh, it's a GL swap interval call, and what you can do is you can pass a value to this uh, here, which says, how many frames do you want to wait before you swap? Right? So when we call our, uh, like our, well, it's not a GL call, when we call our swap buffers call that we were using, right, uh, to display our frame in GL, if this value is set to zero, then it means as soon as we call swap buffers, just put it on the screen. Just do it. I don't care if you're in the middle of displaying a frame, I don't care, whatever, just do it. Right? Uh, if this value is one, it means wait for the next vertical retrace. If the value is two, it means wait for two vertical retraces, right? So it's like every other frame. And three, four, five, six, seven, right? It's all very predictable at that point. Now, it's important to note that this is simply a request. So when we make this call, what we're saying is, this is what we would like to have happen. But OpenGL, like for all we know, we might not even be on a card that even supports vSync. Like vSync is not a guarantee, it's just a hope. And so for shipping the game, we will probably also have to have some logic that tries to look and go, oh, hey, it looks like we're not really getting any V-Sync because like, you know, our frame rate is, you know, is two milliseconds a frame. So obviously that's not happening. Uh, and so try to, you know, maybe insert some delay to try and get us to a 30 frame a second or whatever we want our uh, 60 frame a second, whatever we want our uh, speed to be. Uh, so GL swap interval is is a request, but it's a request we want to make. And it's on most users' machines, if they don't disable it in their control panel, will work and give a reliable vSync. So it's a good thing to use. Uh, OK. So here you can see if I go, uh, someone told me docs.gl was a good place to go, by the way. And it, it is, it does look pretty good. Uh, so I don't know if it's in here, if wiggles in there or swap intervals in here, it isn't. Uh, but this was a pretty good site people recommended for the regular OpenGL calls. It's a pretty nice, uh, it's a pretty nice collection here. Uh, I don't know if you if you've ever played with it. I I was I was pretty happy with it. Uh, anyway, so it's probably Wiggle Swap Interval then. I'm guessing that's what I thought, uh, but I wasn't sure. Uh, let's see. WGLX Swap Control. So this is the extension. All right. So. 
the way that uh, OpenGL works, like I was saying before, is on Windows, um, there's the WGL stuff, which is the Windows bindings for OpenGL, and then there's the GL stuff, which is the actual OpenGL, right? And so what we are actually talking about here is a wiggle side thing, so it's a Windows side thing. And what this means uh, is that we have to call through wiggle uh, to actually, you know, to, uh, we, we have to, we're, we're calling through the Windows part of things. It's, it's part of the Windows thing. It's not common, so it won't work on OS X to make this uh, same call, for example, right? Uh, and so what that means, if we actually do it this way, and I can't remember if there's a, 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 an ARB swap interval. I don't even remember, but there probably isn't. Anyway, uh, so point being, since we're doing that, it means that we have to call through Wiggle. Now, the problem is, I believe this uh, swap interval was, was added after uh, the, uh, the version of, of OpenGL that's, that ships in Windows, uh, the, the, the version of the bindings, the Windows bindings. So I believe that if we call WGL uh, swap interval, it will be an unknown um, identifier. So like, for example, we will create context, right? Which is a function we are using in Wiggle. It's, it's, it's just there, right? And it, of course, it's telling me that I, it doesn't take zero arguments, which is true, but you know, it's there. Wiggle swap interval is not an actual function that was in Wiggle originally. Uh, and that's totally fine because there is an extension mechanism inside Wiggle to get new functions uh, that you can then call. And so what we want to do here is inside uh, our code, right? Here's our swap buffers call. Uh, when we init our OpenGL, there it is. Uh, when we init our OpenGL, what we want to do is after, and I guess we don't need this anymore either. Uh, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and get any of these extensions that we might need. And these extensions work ex almost exactly like what you've seen me do in the past for getting Win32 functions that we need, right? Uh, basically, if there's a function that we need that wasn't in the base services that we're linking with, uh, what we can do is we can call, you know, get proc address, like for Windows, we call get proc address. And that basically says, hey, Windows, I know there's a function named this, do you support it? And if you do, please return me a pointer to it so I can call it. Uh, and so what happens in, in Wiggle, right, uh, is you call the exact same thing, but I believe you call Wiggle get proc address uh, not regular get proc address, right? So it's its own query extension. Uh, so you call wiggle get proc address and it sends you back an, an API pointer uh, that you can then use. But other than that, it's all exactly the same. So I can call wiggle get proc address. I can ask for the function that I actually want, uh, which is this, right? Uh, and then it will give it to me if it is there. Uh, so I can have wiggle swap interval ext, wiggle swap interval equals wiggle get proc address if wiggle swap interval, wiggle swap interval one, which would set vsync uh, for every frame. Okay? Uh, and so what I want to do here is I would like to be able to take the function prototype and just make sure I can keep it, which is what I'll do here. So I can say, okay, here's the function prototype. Again, this is exactly the same thing as I've done many, many times on the stream already. Okay. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and put that up at the top here where we kind of do this, this sort of stuff, right, that we commonly do. Uh, and I don't really know that I need to do anything fancy with this guy. I, I don't think I need to use any sort of macros for him or anything like that because I'm not actually going to create a stub for this particular guy. Uh, so we just have to type def him like this. Now we can load him uh, when we do wiggle swap interval ext. Uh, the other thing I should probably do is, is mark it with a win API call uh, because it is one. That won't matter in 64-bit code, but if we ever compile for 32-bit, it might matter because uh, of the calling convention. Anyway, so what I want to do now is I want to go to that wiggle swap interval and I got to do the cast here. Uh, and I guess I should just do this as if this could just be a global, right? Uh, where we check it and, and we use it so that we can keep the value of it around. All right. 
Uh, so I'll do wiggle swap interval ext, wiggle swap interval. Uh, and that will be a global variable, like so. Uh, and so now, uh, when we run this guy, uh, I should probably step through the code and show it to you, but uh, now you can see that we're running at a locked 60 frames a second, right? Uh, you can kind of see that it's a 16 milliseconds and everything's running at the correct speed. And that's because uh, OpenGL is waiting uh, to, to do that flip until the frame boundary. Make sense? Uh, and so if I didn't call that, again, just so you can see what happens if I don't call it, in case you missed it from before, uh, or I call it with zero, for example, which says don't sync, uh, then we just go at the maximum possible speed that the graphics card allows, and you can see that it, we're running at way, way faster, right? We're running at about eight times uh, seven, seven to eight times faster, uh, and so the game would just run like it was on, you know, speed or something. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, how that works. But we're not, we're not quite done yet for a number of reasons. Like, first of all, we don't know how long this actually is because it might be that the swap interval is actually like maybe it's a hundred and twenty hertz display, in which case it wouldn't be sixty frames a second for frames, it would actually be uh, 120 frames a second, right? So we have more work to do there, we're not done yet. Uh, and the other thing that's worth noting is the way that uh, the OpenGL extension mechanism technically works is that calling wiggle get proc address is not technically sufficient. Uh, what we're supposed to do is check for the existence um, of extensions uh, by checking a string and you can see here like that they talk about this a little bit uh, Because there's no way to extend WGL these calls are defined in the ICD and can be called by obtaining the with the wiggle get proc address Because this extension is a wiggle extension. It is not included in the GL extension string Its existence can be determined with a wiggle X extension strings extension So technically what you're supposed to do is ask the driver for this wiggle X extension string which you can do Look to see whether its extension string is in there right uh, which is this one, I believe. Uh, and if that's there, then it's there. And if it's not, it's not. Now, the stupid thing about this is that you don't actually know uh, that you can get it after you see that string. You, you still have to make this function call and who knows what the function call is gonna return. It might still return zero, right? Uh, so I find it's usually better to check this way. I like to check this way better, but it's not technically correct because in theory, if the extension string isn't there, then in theory you could be getting the pointer to some other wiggle swap interval function that does something different, right? In theory. So it's kind of worth understanding that that's there, right? So if we wanted to, we could make this a little bit more technically correct by getting the extension string and then doing if stir stir, you know, on the extension string. Well, not really stir stir. You, you need to actually parse it and see that you didn't get like a partial match, right? Um, so you need to actually parse it and then say, you know, is it found in there? And, uh, and, and that'd be a little bit more correct. On swap interval, that's really not necessary because that's the only way that you can ever have this function. So I don't know how useful that actually is, but it's just worth understanding. Uh, okay, so that's one type of extension down, which is wiggle extension, and we needed that for our vblank, right? We needed that for, for this. Uh, but there's another type of extension that we want, uh, because remember, right now, our rendering is actually wrong uh, in hardware. It's actually, our, our rendering in software is actually more correct than our rendering in hardware at the moment. And the reason for that is our, our hardware renderer doesn't understand the fact that we're using sRGB at the moment, right? Um, we're using, um, uh, we're, we're actually using uh, a, um, an encoding, right? An sRGB encoding for our textures. We're not quite exactly sRGB. We're actually using squared, a squared mapping. So we square values uh, in the textures, which is not uh, really the correct gamma ramp, at least not quite. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly correct uh, to say that it's sRGB, but 
uh, we, we would like, ideally, the graphics card to be doing uh, sort of the sRGB rendering uh, for us, right? And so that's another thing that we could, if we wanted to, uh, turn on. And so let me, let me uh, just at least point you in that direction. We have a little bit of a sort of a, an issue to work out there uh, that we can talk about, but we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. So uh, frame buffer. All right. Uh, so here we are with ARB frame buffer sRGB. And you can kind of see in here, there's just a bunch of verbiage talking about the extension. Uh, but basically what happens is uh, when you actually create uh, a pixel format, like we were doing before, I know you remember uh, we did this in init OpenGL, where we do this, this thing here, where we do describe uh, desired pixel format and all that stuff. Uh, when we do that, uh, when we're in the PI attributes parameter for, for um, I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, when we're doing uh, choose visual, right, uh, we can pass this sort of this sort of stuff. Now this is looks like the Linux docs. It's actually the Wiggle ARB frame buffer sRGB one that we actually care about here. So I'm not sure if they document that one specifically. Let me see. Doesn't look like it. Uh, let me just let me see if they've got it. Let me see if they've got an example somewhere. I don't know if they do or if they don't. Uh, but basically, when we create our frame buffer, we can make it be uh, sRGB if we want it to be. Uh, so it's this is our capability flag. But where is the actual? Where is the actual? Well, let's let's see here. Let's see. Oh, that's. Not reassuring, but okay. Well, I can't actually find really anyone it looks like who's talking about this, which is unfortunate. Uh, but what are you going to do? Uh, so we'll just kind of we'll 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 just wing it, uh, which will be fine. Uh, so the point is anyway, ignore all this stuff. Sometimes I'm able to find things on the web to show you, and sometimes I'm not. Uh, the point is that like we handled uh, gamma correction basically in our software renderer which if you don't remember that please go back and and watch those uh, because I it would take quite some time to go through it all again but like we tried to handle gamma correctly there's a couple of things we can set in OpenGL to try and handle gamma correctly uh, in OpenGL and right now we're not setting any of them uh, so as a result like I think in particular there's some things you should probably be able to notice uh, that'll be like too bright or too weird um, like in general the, the colors shouldn't be quite uh, what they are now. Unfortunately, I, this is why I kind of wish we could toggle between our software renderer and not, uh, because that way we could sort of see what the actual difference was uh, color-wise between them. But point being, um, right now, even though we're feeding it squared values for everything, it doesn't know that. And so we don't actually ever get uh, that, uh, that um, when it's doing the blending, we don't get that sRGB awareness. So in order to do that, there's two different places that we have to make sure that the sRGB stuff uh, works, right? And it's exactly the same as what we had to do in our renderer. So if you go look at how our renderer was working, um, you can see that we have our mm square ps function, right? When we loaded in uh, the frame buffer values that we we're going to blend with, right? We squared them. Make sense? Uh, and when we did our texels, they are already in mm, How did we do our texels? Our texels are encoded in sRGB, so how do we convert them? Okay, so we shifted them is how we did it. We did, so the reason we're not squaring them is because we actually just used um, shifting to uh, to make that happen, it looks like, right? Convert texture from sRGB to linear brightness space. And so those are the two things that have to happen at draw time, right? When we grab from the texture, the texture that we grab from has to be converted uh, from sRGB to linear. And when we grab the destination, that has to be converted from sRGB to linear as well. Then after we're done, right? 
uh, when, after we do the combining, then we have to square root to put things back into sRGB space. So we need to tell OpenGL to do those steps. We need to tell OpenGL to like change the textures into linear space, change the destination into linear space, and then change the, change the results back uh, to sRGB space before writing them out. And so uh, really all that has to happen for that is we have to tell it about the, um, the textures. And so in OpenGL, when we submitted the textures, you'll notice that we said what we wanted the in, uh, internal format to be was glRGBA8, right? And so when we submit the texture, uh, what we actually want to do here is submit, I don't know if there's a good listing of these guys, um, but what we want to do is like actually just submit the sRGB version of this, which I don't even remember what their, uh, let me see if I can. Here it is. Uh, so it is, let's see, dependencies, overview, texture as decode code, X controls, whether the decoding of the sample time, texture variant is separate, uh, yeah. Where is the actual value? Here it is. So, it's sRGB8, right? It should be sRGB8, there it is. So it's sRGB8 alpha 8 x right? Um, is I think what we actually want. Could be wrong, that's what we actually want. Uh, which unfortunately, I don't know where the values are. Let's see. Sorry, this is a bit boring. Here it is, finally. Texture image specification. And so you can see the internal formats listed, sRGB8x, sRGB8alpha8x. sRGB8 8 x And so instead of telling it that we have a glRGBA8 texture, we wanna tell it that we have an sRGBA8alpha8 8 extent uh, ext texture, right? So really what wants to happen here is we wanna do something uh, like this, right? We wanna do something like whatever the type of this thing is, I believe this is a gl gluent, right? Uh, so we have our uh, default internal or OpenGL default internal texture format, right? And that format is going to be by default uh, RGBA8. But if we detect that the extension is present, then we will set it to sRGB8 alpha 8x, which means now our textures will always be sampled properly, right? And that doesn't actually help our, um, that doesn't actually help the frame buffer part of things, but that will fix uh, the texture part of things. And so again, I can go in here and make that be uh, one of our globals here uh, for, for the rendering. Like so, uh, and then I can go ahead and, and make that be something that we do. Okay, when we do Win32 init OpenGL. Uh, so when we do Win32 init OpenGL there, uh, and we go ahead and, and make this happen, we can say, okay, the default internal texture format is that. If the extension is present, then it's that, right? Um, or something like this, that'll work just fine. And then the other, only other thing that we're gonna have to figure out uh, is we're going to have to figure out how to turn on the, the frame buffer. Uh, so like uh, sRGB uh, frame buffer OpenGL. And I don't remember what the enable bit is for that, right? Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's GL frame buffer sRGB. It's that guy right there. Um, so we need to also do call that GL enable uh, to make sure that that's on. So we need to do another thing to see like, do, do we have that? extension, and if we do have that extension, then we're gonna try and enable GL frame buffer sRGB. Uh, let's see here, GL frame buffer. Uh, to tell it that, hey, by the way, uh, we would like that to be on, right? Uh, let me see here. So GL frame buffer sRGB is from this extension. Let's 
Did I actually talk about it anywhere? Not really. So anyway, uh, so that's essentially what we have to do. Like we have to do something like extension, like open GL extension is available uh, like this uh, in both cases. And then we would just do that switch. Now these values are of course not, don't exist in our un, you know, extended version of OpenGL. So we will have to define them uh, to be something, uh, to be whatever their actual values are, right? Uh, and I thought the extensions were supposed to have what they are defined to be. I thought that was supposed to be in, in the extension, uh, but I don't actually see it here anywhere. Uh, but I suspect GL extension header file, we could just use uh, some stuff here. So for example, GL frame buffer sRGB. And what I've done here is I've just gone to someone's header file, like the OpenGL uh, uh, core ARB extensions. Uh, they just have them all in one giant header file. We can just grab the ones we actually want. So we want this one, right? Uh, and we want sRGB uh, alpha 8. Oops. Let's see where that's at. SRG, oops, GB8, alpha 8. There it is. Uh, so that's, uh, those are the two that we actually want. Now, GL sRGB8 alpha 8 is not the ext one, which I wonder if that superseded it, it may well have. Because uh, these sorts of things as they go through uh, their little, yeah, it did. Uh, so the way that the OpenGL uh, ARB, ARB, just explain this. ARB, I believe stands for Architecture Review Board, right? So what happens is the way these extensions work is somebody proposes an extension and implements it in their hardware. So like NVIDIA says, oh, I want to implement this sRGB thing. They do it uh, and then they propose it to the ARB as an extension. Uh, it's already implemented in their drivers with their name, right? It'll have like an NVIDIA extension or, or something. If it gets extension, if multiple vendors decide to implement it, the name becomes EXT. And then if the architecture review board says, we want to make this a permanent part of OpenGL going forwards, then it becomes an ARB. And so the names change a lot. They go from like vendor specific to multi-vendor, then to ARB. And then they're just integrated to OpenGL entirely. Uh, and so this is the final one that got actually in, uh, put into our, and so those are the, the values that we actually would want to ask for, I believe. Now, I'm gonna actually comment these out. So we're not gonna even check to see if these extensions are available. We're just gonna go ahead and call these right now, uh, which is not safe. Uh, so we don't actually want to do that. Tomorrow, we're gonna wanna actually make something that does check to see if it's there. But for now, we don't actually have to do that. We can just call it and blissfully be unaware of it, right? Uh, so this guy, these guys, if, if these people want access to these globals, um, we're gonna have to do something like that. And this guy now is this, uh, but that's really it for turning on sRGB. It's just a question of setting some uh, flags like in that fashion. Uh, and this might just work uh, or it might not, we'll find out. Uh, so that I believe is the more correct way of, of, of doing it now. Our textures aren't really sRGB, they're squared, which is not quite right. Uh, so really what we probably wanna do in the future is I'll modify our art packs to use actual sRGB uh, so that it'll be 100% correct and our software renderer will be the one that's less accurate because that's really the way it should be. I mean, the hardware should be the most accurate version. Our software renderer should be the one cutting corners, right? Um, so now we've got actual sRGB rendering happening. Uh, and uh, I feel like you, you can already kind of uh, see that the alpha is a little bit better, right? Um, so it definitely looks a little less janky to me uh, as it is at the moment. Uh, anyway, uh, so that that's again the just the basics of the extension stuff. We'll get it into a little bit more uh, extension stuff 
uh, a little later on. But that's that's basically uh, what that's about. And um, yeah, and now we'll we'll go ahead and, and we'll go to the to the Q and A, uh, perhaps. Uh, and yeah, you can sort of see that that there's like I feel like there's a lot less sort of fringing around the alpha as well, which is nice. Um, but again, it's still going to be a little bit wrong, uh, just because of the way the uh, because we're not our, our textures are not actually sRGB. Uh, okay. So yeah, uh, let's just put a to do in there. Uh, let's see. Will you be implementing multiple render paths depending on your OpenGL context version or available extensions at runtime? Uh, probably not because I don't think we're asking for, like in a 2D game, it's pretty hard to ask for extensions that aren't there, right? Uh, so I doubt it. I mean, if, if there might be, like if we find there's one thing that we want to use that we just don't know if it's there, then we'll, we might have a little predicated thing that's like, if it's here, do this, otherwise do that. Besides it, can you fix the Santa sorting? Uh, yeah, we can fix the Santa sorting. Um, Uh, I don't actually remember how any of this stuff worked, um, uh, but uh, I assume that it's just like because of this uh, situation here. So what is, which one is the Santa situation? Is it, is it intro layers four? I think it's this one. So I'm not sure. I think it's just because this is at negative four and so are all of these. I think that's it. So we have two choices with for how to fix that, right? Um, we can just change the order because I believe our sort is always stable. Um, so that would fix the Santa sorting. The other way to do it is put the other one in a slightly uh, different Z. Let's just wait for it, wait for Santa. There he is. Why is he all... I don't know what's going on there. Did I do something weird? Is changing the order of those, does that do something strange that I don't remember? It's very confusing. I don't really know why that was happening. I'm gonna try putting the background at a slightly further distance just to see what's going on there uh, while I answer another question. Okay, so there are a bunch of questions here that are pretty good. Weird, so for some reason, changing the order really mattered a lot there. Why is that? Is there something special about the first layer that I don't didn't know about? 
It must be that the sort isn't actually stable. I don't know. That's weird. Anyway, that's fine. Uh, let me take some more questions here. Uh, okay. Your maximum frame time is about two to three milliseconds without VSync enabled, but with it enabled, I see it stays at 16 milliseconds most of the time, but sometimes goes to 17 milliseconds. Does that mean it will skip a frame? Is that a problem with VSync? Uh, no, so that's, that's not really what's happening. Uh, so, and in fact, I should make this very clear because this was something that people were confused about before uh, for a totally different reason. And so let me just kind of try to hammer it home. All right. Uh, so in our code, we have a call to swap buffers. So what happens is everything, step one, everything, step two, swap buffers, right? Step three, everything, step four, swap buffers, and so on, okay? So this is the game loop, right? The game loop does all the stuff, it calls swap buffers and all the stuff, swap buffers, all the stuff, right? All the code in between the swap buffers. And swap buffers is the thing that tells OpenGL we're done with the frame. So go do all the stuff and, and display it, right? And some people were under the misconception that this means wait for that. It doesn't. Uh, swap buffer just means that we're done. It doesn't mean that we stop. So it can roll straight on through the swap buffers. It'll, it's just the, telling the driver you can go kick off a frame. So what actually happens is we plow through here, we call the swap buffers call, that kicks off the graphics to let it know it can start rendering, if it hasn't already, which it probably actually has started processing, right? Uh, but we keep going and then we get to the next swap buffers and we kick that off too, right? Because remember, when we don't have vsync enabled, we only take two milliseconds to sync a frame, okay? So we sync a frame, this is two milliseconds, we sync another frame in two milliseconds, we could even sync a third frame potentially, right? And this frame will not even have been shown on the screen yet. Then what will happen is at some point, depending on how the graphics card has chosen to set itself up, right? Uh, whether it's uh, double or triple buffered, right? Uh, at some point, we'll go to a swap buffers and it's like, I'm too, I'm, I can't take any more stuff. I'm too far behind now. And that is when we will actually wait. If that makes sense. Uh, so as far as I know, and I have not looked at this recently, so maybe this is old and someone's gonna tell me, no, that doesn't do that anymore. But as far as I know, swap buffers doesn't actually block your process, or I should say the, that thread. It doesn't actually block your thread until the driver actually decides it doesn't want any more info from you. The driver, if it wanted to, could decide that it quadruple buffers, right? And then it's four frames ahead all the time. Our game is four frames ahead. And, you know, the, uh, the graphics card is, is sort of chewing on all those frames and displaying them, right? Now, the graphics card probably could let you get very far ahead because this has a lot of memory and it can do a lot of stuff, right? Uh, but the reason it doesn't is because you don't, the latency increases however long you do this for, right? Because every one of these frames that took two milliseconds to compute takes 16 milliseconds to display when you wait for the vSync, right? So the more frames we sync in the pipeline, the more latency there is in the controller. So while we do want to be one frame ahead, because the graphics card has to have something to work on while we're working, we want some overlap there. We don't want to be like 12 frames ahead because now all of a sudden you can feel the lag. And now that, that action game is not going to feel very good anymore. Right. Um, but so what you're seeing when we report the frame time has nothing to do. It's literally unrelated, that number, to waiting for a frame to be displayed. What it is, is it's waiting for the driver to tell us when it wants more information. And the reason it comes out to 60 milliseconds is because, hey, since it's waiting till the vSync to display the next frame, 
the point where it tells us when it wants more information after it's gotten as far ahead as it wants to get. That point will therefore be very close to the frame time. But they're not, they could, they could be literally completely different if the driver wanted them to be. There's no real correlation between them other than the fact that a well-working driver is basing it off of that frame time. So yeah, it has nothing, we won't, aren't in any danger of missing a frame because of that, if that makes sense. Is object-oriented programming bad in general or for game purposes, and why? It's bad in general, and I've covered it many times. Uh, Rohit N, I believe you do a stir-stir of GL extensions, then check if the end of the extension is null, a space, or tab to see if it exists. Uh, yeah, we can do that, but I think what I'd rather do is just parse it and have just a little hash table that tells us whether the extensions that we want are there or not, right? So I saw the kid, is there any reason to make the swap interval larger than one? Yes, and we will probably do it ourselves on Handmade Hero. Uh, the reason is because let's suppose that we're on a machine uh, and we find that we are unable to hit the actual frame rate of the monitor, right? Uh, so we're doing a thing where we're like, okay, uh, you know, we wrote frame B, C, whatever, and this each one of these is like at 60 milliseconds, 16 milliseconds or whatever, but the machine's really slow and we're not hitting it, right? So we're not hitting these boundaries. We're coming in late. What we can then do is downshift to 33 milliseconds per frame and set the swap interval to two so that we can run at 30 frames a second locked if we can't run at 60, right? Is there an asynchronous way to do vsync? I mean, a way to ask OpenGL if it has displayed the frame or how much time you have to wait until the frame is going to be displayed? Uh, not that I know of. There might be in like, in very recent OpenGL, like 4.x, it's maybe there's a, there, there like, there might be a, a fence of some kind you can set for that, but I don't know. I've certainly never done that, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an extension or something that does do it. Uh, Ezio Audito Rerevs, how would you allow the game to run at a non 60 frames a second rate and not speed up, slow down the animation speed? Uh, well, it's pretty sim straightforward, right? Um, our game already just runs off of a DT. Uh, so this value right here is just as long as when you run the, as long as when you call the game, game update and render, as long as you pass the correct value for that for whatever your update rate actually is, then you're fine. Elvin, apologies if you explained this before. Since rotation is stored in the upper 3x3 part of the transfer matrix and scale is stored in the 001122 diagonal, how do they play well together? I mean, wouldn't change the rotation or scale affect the other? Uh, let's hold off on that question for a second. Let me see if there's anything related uh, to what we're doing right now first. Uh, quickly, games, you mentioned 120 hertz. How do you handle skipping every other vsync event? Do you just detect the mono refresh rate? rate and if 120 hertz swap twice in a row. Uh, yeah, basically if we detect that the monitor refresh rate is higher than 60 hertz, what we can do is set um, swap interval to whatever that divisor is, or at least we can try. Connor Rents, if vSync is disabled in Windows, will there be no vSync at all? Correct. If vSync is disabled in Windows, we will not get it. Um, and that's why I say it's a request, not a, a guarantee. Uh, the glove in the scene where Krampus is giving it to the kid looks a bit strange with the thumb pointing downwards. Okay, noted. Long Boolean, why does VSync cause input lag on some machines? Uh, because again, it means that there's a deeper buffering. Like, VSync adds latency. Just period, right? Because it's delaying when a frame is, frame is displayed until the point when it won't tear. And so there's always going to be a little bit of latency there. So it doesn't add much, 
uh, but it can add some. And especially if the frame rate is low, like if the frame rate's only 30 or frames a second or 15 frames a second, 20 frames a second, uh, you end up with with a lot with some some possibly noticeable time being added in there. What are the trade-offs of storing the textures on disk in the same linear color space format you are using? Um, you don't really want to store textures in a linear color space because uh, you waste a lot of bits. Uh, the human eye doesn't perceive dark tones um, the same way it perceives light tones. Light tones need less data than dark tones to represent proper, properly, so that's why we have sRGB in the first place. So in order to get better color quality for the same number of bits in your textures, you want to store them non-linearly. And that's why we do this nonsense with changing from the non-linear space to the linear space to operate on them and then putting them back. It's just so that we don't use unnecessary amounts of data. C Flickster, any update on when to implement sound effects? Uh, who knows, whenever we decide that's a good idea. Garlando Bloon, what is the bottle full of that? What is the bottle full of that John posts on Twitter? I have no idea. Niblo, we're still fading from to the desktop. Did you have to re-implement that? Is it being hardware rendered? Is the fade here to stay? Uh, so the reason that that's back is because uh, when we switched OpenGL to being to not be double buffered and instead to be uh, just background blitter or whatever. Uh, the same thing that fixed OBS allows our over-the-top window to still work. So that's why that's working. With wiggle swap interval, do we still have to do sleep at the end of the frame? Could you also comment on GL finish, GL flush, and how they're used? Uh, sure. So wiggle swap interval, uh, like I said, doesn't actually um, guarantee us the VSync. So we don't have to sleep at the end of the frame if wiggle swap interval is working. But if it's not working, we will probably have to. But yeah, it will do a sleep there for us effectively. So we don't have to sleep if wiggle swap interval is sleeping. So, so that's a good thing. Uh, GL finish and GL flush are not really relevant for us. Uh, GL finish and GL flush just tell the graphics card about particular times when you want stuff to happen. So for example, if you want to force all rendering to finish, you can call GL flush, I believe. I don't remember which is which. They each, one of them is a, a more stringent guarantee than the other. Uh, and I don't remember uh, which one is the more stringent. I never call these functions. Um, let's see, GL flush. Uh, yeah. So I guess what I would say is GL finish, from briefly reading that, GL finish is the full completion one. So basically GL finish says, I want to wait until you finish all the rendering that you have to do and don't come back to me until that's true. So that pipeline where I was saying, like, we kick off the renders and they're going while we're doing stuff. If you want to say, no, I want you to finish everything right now, please you could call GL finish. We don't really want to do that, so we don't call that, but that's what that would be. Uh, GL flush, on the other hand, is just a way of saying, hey, if you're buffering anything right now, uh, in anticipation of kicking it off, I would like you to kick it off now. Don't wait till it's done, but kick it off, please. So it's kind of like uh, asking um, for like a buffer flush in like the C runtime library, where you're saying, hey, actually go flush this buffer of, of stuff I'm writing out to disk, please. But it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the operating system has finished writing it, right? It's just saying, hey, kick off the write. Uh, insofar as we use x swap tear negative one in the swap interval call, uh, hopefully not. Should we wait for swap buffers? Wait, after hours it returns too fast. Yes, that's what I was saying before, where I was like, we're still going to have to do um, some work there.
would it be better to minimize or maximize how much you do per frame? Uh, like, would it be better to make your program take any time that it would be waiting for vSync and instead focus it on performing more computations, even potentially computing things ahead of time? Uh, but that's what we are doing, right? Um, that's exactly what, what's, what the swap buffers currently does. Um, like I said, you come through to your swap buffers call, and if, if it can keep buffering up, it will. But if you've reached the end of the amount of buffering that the GPU is going to do, then you stop. So you already are able to get quite far ahead, right? And, but you don't, you just, you got to stop at some point, otherwise your game runs off and now your input lag is way too big, right? Um, so you have to only buffer one or two frames, you can't let it go too far. Uh, Tiberian, how do you easily detect if vSync is active? Uh, you just got to check the monitor resync, refresh if you can, uh, and then see how long it takes and make sure they're similar, right? Okay. Let's see here. How do I vsync and prevent tearing with a dual monitor setup? Is it any different than a single monitor setup? Uh, yeah. Okay. So if you're if you're on a dual monitor setup, you have to do a thing called a swap uh, a swap chain or a swap group. Uh, swap group. Uh, you got to do this stuff. Um, basically, what you do is you say like, okay, I'm gonna like issue all the rendering calls I need to each of these contexts, one for each of the windows that I'm trying to draw, and then depending on uh, you know all of those, depending on assuming that you want them all to update at the same time, maybe you have you know if you have 12 monitors and you want six to be one time and six to be the other or something. But assuming you want them all at one time, they're all added to something called a swap group. And then you say, okay, I need you to go ahead and, and update the swap group now, right? And then that'll flip them all at the same time. All right, it is 6.30, so... I think I will conclude. Boop. Boop. All right, I think that's everything. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Heroes. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you uh, want to follow along at home, you can always uh, pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code which you can use to follow along the series if you would like. That's at handmadehero.org. Uh, there's also links to the forums where you can go to ask questions about the series. There's our Patreon page where you can support the video series and there is our tweet bot which of course tweets the schedule at you if you want to catch the series live. And if you do want to catch the series live, you can catch it live tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, if I'm not too sick by then. Uh, and uh, that will be our last stream of the week. That's about it for now. Uh, I will catch you guys uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Until then, have fun programming, and I'll see you all on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.